I'm usually the first one here on Sunday mornings, but at about 9.45 this morning, we realized we'd left something at home, so I jumped in the car, ran to the house, and as I was coming back up Taylorsville Road, I thought, boy, there's a little bit of traffic this morning. And then six cars in front of me all turned to come to North Point. And I thought, wow. So I pull around and pull into the parking lot, and the parking lot's full, the overflow lot's starting to fill up. And I couldn't help but think to just a few years ago, when we started with just a handful of people in a beauty salon. I just can't believe what God is doing. I mean, it just exceeds my expectations so much. We're now planning for a second overflow lot. And it's cool to think about, but to see that this morning, to see that many people pulling into this building, to see the parking lot filling up, to see what God is doing here, is just worthy of His praise. And it touched me, it really did. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here today. Maybe it's your first time. We're just simple Christians. We're not trying to impress anybody. We're just trying to please God and go to heaven. And we're so thankful that you're here. You've come on a good day because it's the third Sunday of the month. And on the third Sunday of the month, we have our love feast. It's right after worship service. Everybody's invited. We hope you'll stick around for that. They had love feast in the early church to foster mutual love and unity among the members. And this went on for several centuries before love feasts were finally outlawed by man-made religious councils in the 4th century. But we're trying to go back to the beginning. We're trying to be like that early church. They had love feasts, so we want to have love feasts. It's a time to bond together. It's a time to set aside whatever differences the world may see in us and be one in Christ. So that's right after worship. We really hope you'll stick around for that. We're looking forward to it. And you know, I've been thinking a lot about Love Feast this week, mainly because our dear brother J.D. Baker sent me the link to a religious journal from the 1800s that talked about Love Feasts. This journal is affiliated or was affiliated with the Restoration Movement. And J.D. sent me this link. He said, hey, I found an article you might want to look at. This is what the journal looked like. It was called The Christian Evangelist. And notice the date. November 17, 1892. Well, if you look through this journal, you'll see that there's an article entitled The Lord's Supper by D.L. Miller. If you'd like to read this article in its entirety, I highly recommend that. You can find it at our website. Just go to the articles link. It's the very first article. But as I read this article, I just marveled at how spot on it was. I even joked with JD. I said, if you didn't know better, you'd think a member at North Point wrote that. And um, I'll just share a little bit of the article with you. It's a lengthy article. I'm just going to share just a little snippet. The article begins by saying... None of the controversies which arose in the first centuries of Christianity were more bitter than that known as the Paschal Dispute. It grew out of the question as to the proper time for observing the Lord's Supper and resulted finally in dividing the Eastern and Western Christians and gave the world the Roman and Greek churches. But through all the disputes which arose and the differences that obtained in this great controversy... The validity of a full meal, known as the Lord's Supper, or agape, in connection with which the cup and loaf of the communion were given to the disciples, was never questioned. Notice what he says. He says, there were a lot of controversies that arose in the early church, in the first centuries of Christianity. None of those controversies was more bitter than the one surrounding the Lord's Supper. And in particular, as to the proper time for observing the Lord's Supper. A lot of questions about that, a lot of disputes about that. In fact, this actually led to division among the church. But he said, yet all the while, during all those controversies, 
the one thing they all agreed upon, the one thing that caused no division was the validity of a full meal in connection with the emblems. The bread and cup representing the body and blood of Jesus. Did you notice that? He said the validity of a full meal known as the Lord's Supper or agape in connection with which the cup and loaf of the communion were given to the disciples was never questioned. That's significant. They had a lot of disputes, right? A lot, a lot of things they disagreed upon concerning the Lord's Supper. But the one thing they all agreed upon was the validity of the full meal in connection with the emblems. The article goes on to say, The meal was observed by the apostolic church much the same as our people observe it today. All the brethren able to do so brought together a portion of the meal. In the evening they ate together, each one helping himself from a common table. After eating at an economical meal, the bread and wine, the emblems of the body and blood of Christ, were administered. And either before or after communion, they saluted each other with the holy kiss of peace. The supper was designated as a feast of charity, or love feast, and was continued for several centuries until it was swept aside by the corruption that flooded the church as a result of the increase of wealth, pride, and power. He said the early church met in the evening. That goes with Acts 20, verse 7. That's also what the Greek word for supper means. It was the evening meal. And so he recognizes the early church, the apostolic church, they assembled in the evening and ate this meal. The brethren each brought a portion if they could do so. And after the meal, the bread and wine, the emblems of the body and blood of Christ were administered. So they ate the love feast and then at the end of the love feast, they took the bread and cup representing the body and blood of Jesus. He says this supper was designated as a feast of charity or love feast. That's Jude 12. And it continued for several centuries until corruption crept in and changed things. That is absolutely true. That is what the Bible and extra biblical evidence suggest. And I was so happy to see our restoration brethren taking that position. And this is the consensus of nearly every biblical scholar. I'll give you just one example. Most people are very familiar with the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Very reputable. Most preachers have this in their library. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, The agape was a meal at which not only bread and wine, but all kinds of viands were used. A meal which had the double purpose of satisfying hunger and thirst and giving expression to the sense of Christian brotherhood. At the end of this feast, bread and wine were taken according to the Lord's command. I know some brethren think we're odd for having love feasts at North Point. But if they could jump in a time machine and warp back to the first century, they'd be the odd ones for thinking that you should take the bread and cup without a broader meal. I hate that corruption changed things. I hate that man-made religious councils much later than the New Testament outlawed love feasts. They had no right to do that. And I hate that many of our brethren are missing out on the benefit and blessing of these feasts of charity. But my point today is this. I want to make sure we keep the love in love feast. You see, this is not just a common meal designed to satisfy hunger. There's a spiritual component to it. This meal was divinely ordained for the purpose of stirring up affection and unity among members. It was designed to show and stimulate our love. And brethren, I want to make sure we're doing that. I want to make sure we're keeping the love in love feasts. 
Well, what is love? What is love? You know, if you asked a hundred people to define love, they'd probably all define it a little bit differently. What is love? Perhaps no biblical word has lost more power in translation than love. We use it in reference to everything from sodas to spouses. In the same day, you might say, I love chocolate cake and I love Jesus Christ. Well, obviously, the weight of that word varies drastically, right? You don't love cake and Christ the same. But we use the same word for both. That wasn't true biblically. Did you know there are four different Greek words that we translate as love in English? Eros, storge, phileo, agape. Eros, from which we get the English word erotic, refers to sensual or sexual love. Storge refers to natural affection, the kind of love that a parent would have for their child. Phileo refers to brotherly love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's from the Greek word phileo. And agape. Agape was the highest form of love. It was a love that went beyond emotion and sought the very best for its object. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, love your enemies. Love who? Love your enemies. How could I possibly do that if my love was based on my emotions? How could I possibly do that if my love was based upon feelings? Well, that's not true of agape. Agape is a willed love. It's a determined love. You might put it like this. Agape is behavioral, not sentimental. That's why Christ could say, love your enemies. You may not like them. You may not approve of what they do. But you can still have their best interest at heart. Well, that's the word in Jude 12 for love feast. The early Christians referred to it as the agape, the love feast, the highest form of love. A love that said, I'm putting your interest above my interest. That's what the love feast is all about. And so it's important that we understand what we mean by love. The Bible gives us a description of love. In 1 Corinthians 13. But let me kind of set the stage. In 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, Paul deals with a misuse of the spiritual gifts. The Corinthians had been blessed abundantly with different miraculous abilities. And yet these blessings had become a problem. Because they were envious and jealousy uh, and jealous. Well, why does he have that gift and I only have this one? And so, in chapters 12 through 14, Paul is trying to correct this situation. And right in the middle, there's a chapter on love. Why is that? Why does Paul, in the middle of dealing with their misuse of the spiritual gifts, devote an entire chapter to love? Here's why. Paul wants the Corinthians to know that everything they do has to be motivated by love. It has to be the driving force. It has to be the motivating factor. You can perform all kinds of miraculous gifts, but if you're not doing it in love, it doesn't benefit you at all. In fact, he wraps up chapter 12 by saying, Look, covet the best of the miraculous gifts, yet I'm about to show you a more excellent way. That's the way of love. Well, as you come to 1 Corinthians 13... The chapter divides neatly into three parts. Verses 1 through 3, the necessity of love. Verses 4 through 7, the characteristics of love. Verses 8 through 13, the permanence of love. We're going to look at the characteristics of love. This is what love looks like. If love were a person, this is how he'd behave. Verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Fifteen characteristics of love. Let's break them down quickly. What is love? Paul said love is patient. That means long-suffering. The Greek word actually means long-tempered as opposed to being short-tempered. So that's number one. Love is patient. Love is kind, meaning gracious or gentle. Love does not envy. It's not jealous. Love does not boast. It's not a braggart. Love is not arrogant. It's not proud or self-consumed. Love is not rude. It's not unbecoming or indecent. Love does not insist on its own way. It's not self-seeking. Love is not irritable. It's not easily provoked or angered. Love is not resentful. It's not bitter. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It takes no pleasure in sin. It does rejoice with the truth. That is, it delights in truth. Love bears all things. That word can mean either it endures or it protects. Love believes all things. That is, it's not cynical. It's trusting. Love hopes all things. It's optimistic. It gives people the benefit of the doubt. And love endures all things. That is, it perseveres in spite of offenses. If love were a person, this is what he'd be. Fifteen characteristics of love. My question is, how are we doing with that? You think of the perfect example, Jesus Christ. He personified love, right? In fact, you could substitute His name in place of love. You could say, Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on His own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Right? We all agree that's true of Jesus. But is it true of Aaron? Could I say Aaron is patient and kind? Aaron does not envy or boast. Aaron, no. I already missed it. And yet we're commanded to love. It's a process, right? None of us are going to master it. Only Jesus could do that. But don't you understand, one of the qualifying marks of a Christian, perhaps the greatest qualifying mark of a Christian, is love. And this is what love is. And that kind of love should be manifest in our love feasts. We're not just there to fill our bellies. We're there to love our brethren. That's what the love feast has always been about. And so let's think about love feast in the first century. The Greco-Roman world was a very divided world. There were a lot of walls, a lot of barriers between people. And yet, one of the beautiful things about the love feast is at least for a moment, those walls were knocked down. Everybody could feast together as equals, as one in Christ. Think about it, master and slave. Did you know that in the first century, slaves were viewed as property? They weren't considered people. They had no rights as a person. Slaves were considered property. They'd be like your couch or your car. You can do whatever you want with it. And there are many accounts of slaves being terribly abused by their masters. Did you know that masters would often brand their slaves like somebody might brand cattle today? 
You could whip your slave, you could dismember your slave, you could kill your slave with no repercussions. There was a wall between master and slave, and yet at the love feast, guess what? They sat side by side as equals. The slave was no longer inferior, they were brothers in Christ. Or you think about the wall between Jew and Gentile. Did you know that when a Jew re-entered Jewish territory, having been among the Gentiles, he would shake out his robe and shake off his sandals as a sign of repudiation? This was a common practice. If you had been out among the Gentiles, and now you re-enter the land of Israel, you would literally start doing this. And it wasn't to wipe off the dust. It was a sign of repudiation. It was a sign that I was among those people. And yet at the love feast, here are Jews and Gentiles sitting side by side, fellowshipping together as one. Or you think about man and woman. Even among the Jews, women were often treated as second-class citizens. Did you know that Jewish men would not speak to a woman in public? Not even his own wife or daughter. When traveling, the men would usually travel several feet before the women. Women were looked down upon. And yet at the love feast, here are men and women, male and female, sitting side by side. And then you have the outcast. The foreigner... The guy with that reputation, right? Do you see the beauty in it? I see why God did this. Even today, there are a lot of differences among people, right? A lot of distinctions, a lot of discrimination. You ever been to a church, I have, that has class distinctions? They don't say they do, but they do. <laughs> You have the upper class, you have the middle class, you have the lower class. And they all tend to gravitate toward their particular people. God designed the love feast to destroy that. To knock down those walls. Paul said in the book of Galatians that we are all one in Jesus Christ. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're master, slave, male or female. We're all one in Jesus Christ that was the point and purpose of the love feast. And I want to make sure we're keeping the love in our love feasts. No one here is greater than anybody else. We might have different roles. We may have different responsibilities. But when it comes to our inherent value, we're all equal. We're all just brothers and sisters. That's what the love feast was all about. Going back to that article that J.D. sent me, and again, I highly recommend it. I hope you'll read it. It's a lengthy article, but it's filled with great information. The writer uh, quotes different historians and scholars and commentators. I'm just going to give you three because it emphasizes my point about the love feast. Schaff, he wrote volumes on church history. It's a great set. Schaff says that the love feast was a simple meal of brotherly love in which the Christians, in communion with their common Redeemer, forgot all distinctions of rank, wealth, and culture, and felt themselves to be members of one family of God. Notice what these meals were about. They were meals of brotherly love. Jenkins says that the love feast was a feast to testify, continue, and increase brotherly love among themselves, as also to the poor who hereby were relieved. Again, emphasis on meals of brotherly love. And Cave says, love feast were designed to testify and confirm their mutual love and kindness. You see the point, don't you? Love Feast isn't just a cute name. 
it's descriptive of what this is all about. And if we were to, we won't do it, but if we were to look at 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about an abuse of the love feast, Paul says, look, there is division among you. That was a class distinction, a class division. Paul says, I'm not going to commend you, I'm going to reprove you, because there are divisions among you at this mill. He says, you're not even waiting for each other to eat this mill. Paul doesn't condemn the mill, but he certainly condemns the way they were eating the mill. When you boil it down, look at 1 Corinthians 11. When you boil it down, they had taken the love out of love feast. And Paul says, if you're going to do that, you might as well just eat at home. God forbid that ever happen at North Point. And so now that we know what love is, now that we know what love feasts were designed to be, I want to issue a challenge. For some of you, this is going to be an easy challenge. You got the personality for it. But I fear that for others, this simple challenge might be difficult. I want you to overcome that difficulty. You can do it. You can do it. And I'm calling on you to do it this morning. Here's the challenge. Sit with someone you've not sat with before this morning. Get away from your regular circle. We've all got them. Get away from your regular circle and cultivate relationships with other brethren. Can you do that? When this service ends, we're going to set up for our love feast. Don't go sit with your homies, right? Don't go sit with your family or your close friends, your clique. Hopefully we don't have cliques. If we do, we got a problem. Let's make the love feast what it was designed to be. Can we do that? You didn't just have masters sitting with masters. You didn't just have Jews sitting with Jews. They were intermingling. Let's intermingle this morning. Can we do that? If we do, then I think our love feast will be pleasing to God. But if we keep those walls of division up, if we only associate with our people then we're no better than the Corinthians were. And Paul said, I condemn your love feasts. I love the third Sunday of the month. Not because we get out of Bible class. I like Bible class. But this is another way to build the church. And uh, if you're visiting with us, you're welcome to stay. But this is such a beautiful thing to see. Brothers and sisters bonding together. Showing true love and unity as Christ intends. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, almighty God, we want to thank you for another Lord's Day. Thank you for the victory of this day. It was on this day that Jesus Christ conquered the grave to never die again. Thank you, Father, that we can share in his victory. Father, thank you for blessing this church so abundantly. You've blessed us not only numerically, but you've blessed us spiritually. You've helped us to stay united. And we pray that you'll continue to keep the devil away. And Father, we pray for our love feast this morning and every time we have one. Help us to keep the love in love feast. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here this morning and not a child of God, we never wrap up without giving you an opportunity to be saved. To be adopted by God into His family. To walk out of here with a clean slate. Isn't that appealing? Jesus Christ did the hard part on the cross so you could do the easy part today. Will you come believing on Jesus with all of your heart? But understand that saving faith is a working faith. You must repent of your sins. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. You're just saying, I'm going to do different. I'm going to do better. I'm going to live for Jesus. You must confess your faith in Him. And if you really believe, why wouldn't you want to do that? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And be immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. You see, in baptism, you're sharing in the likeness of His death, His burial, and His resurrection. 
What a beautiful sight. The power is not in the water, it's in the blood. But Paul said in Romans 6 that we're baptized into his death. Hence, it's in baptism that we contact the benefits of his blood. If you'll take those simple steps, you'll rise up a new creature, cleansed, forgiven, redeemed. If that appeals to you, don't let the devil talk you out of it. For the sake of your soul, come right now as together we stand and sing.